Hi, I'm Ray Christian. Today we're at the beautiful Gold Canyon Golf Resort and Spa. This place is unbelievable. This is a public course, one of the nicest courses in the state of Arizona. Come on out, you won't find a nicer round of golf. We're here today to interview Dennis Allen. Dennis is a great PGA professional and a champion. Dennis is originally from Scotland. He came to this country in 1965 to pursue a career in golf. Dennis has a lot of great stories and anecdotes. Uh, you're gonna love hearing from him. So let's get started. Let's talk to Dennis and see what he has to say. Dennis, welcome to Situation of Golf. It's an honor to have you here today and uh, let's talk about golf a little bit. Now you were originally from Scotland, Dennis, uh, the birthplace of golf. Right. And, uh, one of the country's uh, biggest attractions. Um, what's it mean in Scotland to, to be a golfer and, and, the, and the industry in a, as a whole? Well, Ray, uh, it's great being here with you. What a great setting and a great day that we've got here. And uh, it's a wee bit warmer than it is at Carnoustie in St. Andrews where I grew up, but that's fine too. I enjoy the climate here. I've been here long enough. And so, but talking about golf and your question typically that uh, we got going uh, it's basically a world destination. People love the style of golf because it's mainly on links. It's around the ocean side and the piece, uh, Lynx golf course is a piece of land that's not good for farming. It's a sandy based soil and so it's good for golf courses and therefore that's where the word Lynx comes. You basically don't get a Lynx golf course in Arizona if you will, although some courses are maybe called. But it's a true destination. It was a way of life for me. Uh, I grew up at a little school and a small community, and uh, my sports were football, which is soccer over there, and of course golf. Well, you know, I was inter introduced to the game when I was eight years old, and uh, how I got started was a young man that uh, was a neighbor of mine, and we had just moved into this community, and in the in classroom, we're sitting there, and. Uh, got to chit-chatting and all that and one day he asked me he says uh, why don't you come play golf with me I said pardon me I said what is golf and and he said well just come walk around the golf course and I mean I lived half a mile from the from the first tee but really didn't know it because I didn't know golf and so that uh, took off there one day with him and uh, you know the rest of it became history if you will uh, I was hooked. I jumped up and a family friend had a golf club and so I started out I think with a six iron and I could hit six I could hit all kinds of shots Ray with that six iron. I could hit them low, I could hit them high and of course you needed a putter. And so I started out with just two clubs and uh, but the, the, the thing that really I want to accent was when I started I started wrong because I started with my left hand, I swung right-handed, but my left hand was below my right hand on the golf club. Wow. And found out about a year later, my good friend's dad was the local professional, and he said, Dennis, you're starting to like the game, but he said, we've got to make a change. I said, what do you mean? Because I was getting into it, and you know, based on my age and that, doing pretty good. And I, <clears throat> he says, we've got to change your grip. I said, oh, what's wrong with my grip? He said, well, actually, you have to reverse your hand position. Your left hand should be high and your right hand should be low. I said, oh, okay. So I said, let me try that. And oh my gosh, I tried that and I almost cried. It was so uncomfortable, but I persevered with it because they got my local professional gave me that tip and so I was gonna do what he told me. And uh, <clears throat> I took off from there and of course never thought anything. A couple of three weeks later, I had what is now a normal grip, basically the Varden grip they call it. And so that was me getting started into golf. So Dennis, you mentioned to me one time that St. Andrews is closed on Sunday. What, what, what's that all about? Yeah, you know, it's, it's kind of uh, kept quiet, Ray, but uh, you can't make a booking at St. Andrews on Sunday. Sunday, you're supposed to go to church. I mean, that's the way it's about. I mean, all the Presbyterians there, they go to the churches and all that. But a thing that we did and uh, when I grew up was after Sunday church, we'd go to the putting green and adjacent to the golf course and especially St. Andrews. St. Andrews got a huge area of turf. It's like an acre or so of turf rolling, undulating, and there's four putting, 18 hole putting courses there. Wow. And on Sunday, it's just loaded with families. It's a family day. And so that's why, you know, you can't go to the golf course, but you can go putt. 
And talking about putting, I mean, some of the families had never even stepped foot on a golf course. You can't believe that. You say, what, they're right there at the first tee in St. Andrews and never play golf? But yeah, they have other things in life to do too. And so typically, <clears throat> they are great putters and know how to read a putt and the grain and all that kind of stuff. And uh, back in my era, they were all using hickory shafts. And so at that time, uh, they would spend all afternoon on the putting green. And that would be the family day church. Now about the golf course, the golf course to the public, because it's owned by uh, the city of St. Andrews, the public can walk on the golf course. They walk their dogs and people do that because it's adjacent to the North Sea right there. So they go along the beach and then they'll come back down the golf course. And it's uh, just a lovely picture to see. I've driven through, I take golf tours over there with the uh, members in the past years. And one time I had the coach drive, a ride, drive right through number 18 and number one. There is a public road there. It's called Granny Clark's Wind. And uh, people were saying, and the bus driver was saying, no, I said, yes, you can. <laughs> and so we stopped in the middle of number one and number 18, took pictures of the RNA clubhouse and all that, and what a setting. And it was all about Sunday and just people walking all over where, you know, it's closed. Wow, yeah. that's a lot different than here. It is, it is. Dennis, one time we were talking uh, about Scotland and you mentioned the difference in the, in the schooling systems. Uh, could you expand on that a little bit? Yeah, the schooling system, of course, uh, I graduated when I was 15 years old, but uh, at, when you come 11 years old over there, you sit an examination called 11 plus, and that determines a, a point in the road, if you will, where you can go to higher education or just continue on the an average education and uh, the higher education you go all the way through to and graduate at age 18 and then from there uh, the other one was uh, where you can graduate at 15 but when you think of it 15 is awful young to get out of school and start looking for a job and so you had the option of going into a trade school you could be a carpenter a plumber a joiner um, and uh, I was very fortunate to where um, it's a dying art uh, I became a club maker and wow. I interviewed for a job at a uh, golf company down at Carnoustie and uh, became an apprentice club maker. So I served four, four years as a journeyman and uh, <clears throat> in that fourth year as a, as a journeyman I met a gentleman that came home to see his family from Scotland and this was the door opening for me coming to America. Wow. Dennis, let's go back a step here. Um, We've come so far with golf equipment, there's very few people that even know anything at all about wooden shafts or persimmon heads or anything, how it was back in the old days. Uh, right. what, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, it was so exciting, you know, to get an opportunity to be a club maker and, and, and physically put a club together. And my first job that I got in the apprenticeship was uh, putting wooden shafts together. You know, we talked about the public putting greens and of course a lot of breakages and all that. <laughs> and so we got all the breakages you know, sent to us. And so uh, typically it was a, uh, a hickory shaft. And the key thing in putting a hickory shaft and replacing a hickory shaft was typically to put, you had to make sure you got the grain in. It's like a baseball bat. You have to hit with the grain, not against the grain. And so typically, and then we had to deal with flexes of shafts. And so we put the club in the vise and we whittled it with a, <clears throat> a sharp edge and it was a sharp edge of a saw blade ray and that just shaved it and shaved it until we waggled it because there was no machinery or anything like that waggled it oh yeah that's a regular flex oh that's a whippy <laughs> flex and so it was all by judgment call and the gentleman that i apprenticed under was a master craftsman he'd been doing it for 30 years and when he waggled a golf club and built a persimmon driver, for example, he could waggle it and tell you it was 12 and a half ounces or 13 ounces. It just, it always amazed me. I never got to that touch and that feel in it. But when we put the heads together, it was a persimmon head. Uh, of course, we had to dovetail uh, a plastic insert there. And today, they don't hit it on the screws because it's all a one-piece head, as we know the metal heads. But we would insert, once the insert was in, we'd put in four screws, shave it all down there. We'd file it to the shape and to the size and all that before we stuck the steel shaft into it. And then we pinned it in the back so that, yeah, we glued it in, but we also pinned it to make sure it was secure there. 
and we cut it to the shaft to length and uh, I've got strong hands and arms today and it's from putting on the leather grips because leather grips was the only option that we had and so you whip that and you run that leather grip around the shaft and what have you. Now in that era about six months after I was into the pro shop uh, it was a new one piece rubber grip came out and they said oh this will never work you know here we are the old fashioned we only knew one way was to a wrap grip but the one piece rubber grips came in in approximately 59 and, and 60. The other thing that I saw over the four years apprenticeship was today it's called the logarithmic scale it was a balancing scale for putting a golf club to see what the swing weight is on a golf club and my old boss of course I was telling you about he could waggle it and tell you he said oh that's going to be a piece of you know what and uh, if he was going to throw that out but of course the boss wouldn't let him and so there's a couple of things that came through in that era as to uh, making a making a golf club and it was it was great. Dennis when you were younger you uh, you won some pretty good golf tournaments could you could you tell us about that? Yeah, I uh, you know really worked at it, Ray, and spent a lot of time on the golf course. If my, if my mother ever <clears throat> wanted to find me, she knew where to find me. She always came looking at the golf sure. course because I was out there, out of trouble, off the streets, if you will, and on the golf course uh, playing, practicing, what have you. And you know, in Scotland, uh, you've got a lot of daylight, so you can play comfortably till 11 o'clock at night in the summertime. And so uh, typically, you know, at the way past bedtime, my mother would have to come looking for me. So that was a little bit of why I became a good golfer and I you know, just played day and night and, and that's all I did was play, play, play. I did have a little part-time job on the side, you know, to, a little pocket money, whatever, mm -hmm. to afford to buy golf balls, things like that. But uh, growing up, you know, golf balls were expensive and uh, some days I would in the morning, if I had an afternoon tea time, I'd go out looking for a golf ball. And I'd go out into the, the winds, into the thickets, and uh, find golf balls, and that would be the one I'd play with that afternoon, just getting started. And then I, I moved on and, and won the uh, Junior Club Championship. Um, and, uh, but the crowning glory was uh, where we won the state championship as a team, and I, I was the individual title holder there. So it kind of gave me some direction, said, took a look at myself, what did I want to do? And I wanted to stay in golf, and of course, become a professional golfer. So from there, uh, it took me into a little bit of what I call senior golf because I came 18. I was out of the junior golf ranks, and so the last year I was an amateur. I was about a two handicap, and uh, I went to uh, Nairn up in northern Scotland and played in the men's uh, amateur championship. And to get ready for it, uh, I'd heard somebody talking about practicing on the beach, and so I went down to the beach and practiced off the hard sand. It was a coastal area where there was a lot of sand. It was the it was very tidal, and the the uh, the uh, ocean went out about half a mile. And so I would hit balls back and forth and back and forth, teaching the timing to hit the ball first. Because if you hit it fat, hit behind it, then of course you know that was it. So going from there, I really spent a lot of time doing that and enhancing my game. Scottish amateur. Last year I was an amateur eligible for it. I got to, I think, the, the last 16, which was pretty good for the first year. There's a lot of great golfers in Scotland. The golf club that I grew up at at Carnoustie, Ray, there was a hundred or more golfers with five or better handicap. That was really a lot of competition. Did you ever try and qualify for the big one, Dennis, the Open? I did, uh-huh, yeah. Uh, but I had to come to the States first, and as you said, you know, we came, I came over here in 65 and 68 that was being hosted at Carnoustie, my home course, and so I, I went back then, <clears throat> had to pre-qualify, it's a 36-hole qualifier, and it was on my home course at Money Feath, which is about five miles from Carnoustie, and uh, I shot, I think, 146, and tied for last place with 12 other guys. So guess what? Sudden death, you know. And uh, <clears throat> the first hole was a relatively short hole, and I parred it, and everybody else was birdieing it, and so uh, that was as close as I got. But the fun part, Ray, was <clears throat> of qualifying was 1968 was the last year you had an option to hit the big golf ball and the little ball. What do I mean? Little ball was always played in Europe and in Scotland. It was a 1.62 in diameter, and over there because of the elements, it was a ball that penetrated and didn't fly high. And uh, 
but the, of course the American was using the big ball and that was a 1.68 in diameter. So for the qualifying of the open, we could use either ball. So guess what? We hit the big ball downwind and the little ball into the wind. And that was a great experience wow. right there. Really enjoyed that. And of course the following year that ball rule became universal and it was the big ball for everybody. So Dennis, I understand that you were at the British Open for the Vandeveld meltdown. Yeah, I the was. famous meltdown. Could you, could you explain about that? Oh yeah, I mean that was a story that went around the world as you know about how that guy really screwed up. <clears throat> but uh, we were there, I uh, had a golf group uh, of members from the club here in uh, Sun Lakes and uh, we went to the tournament and of course the last round Vandeveld has a three shot lead playing the last hole in the open. And all he has to do is, you know, he can double bogey it and win it. And so his tee shot, he knocks it in the burn, the famous burn there in the 18th hole. And he takes a drop and he's trying to go for the green. Now he can't go for the green in most people's minds because there's a burn in front of the green there and you've got to carry it a good 230 yards. And uh, his caddy's trying to take the club out of his hand and saying, no, no, just lay up and get on the green and get a bogey and get out of here and win the open. But no, he was obviously a very stubborn man and he went for it, came off of it and it hit the grandstand in a solid part and ricocheted right back into the burn. So now he's in this amount of water. What people don't know, that burn is not flowing level. The tide is coming in and this burn is tidal so the water is backing up. And by the time Mr. Vandeveld made up his mind, took off his shoes, took, rolled up his pants and everything to go in to try and hit the ball. The water is getting deeper and deeper and deeper. Of course, his decision, you know, he didn't do it. But uh, so he finally wound up uh, tying for the, uh, the championship and lost to uh, Paul Laurie in a playoff. So Dennis, you have more than one story about the Open. Um, let's hear another one. Oh, a great experience. One of my first ones, uh, 15 years old. The Open was at St. Andrews in 1960, and uh, so we went over to volunteer to carry the scoreboards for the players. And in the, <clears throat> in the last round, I was uh, carrying for uh, two great golfers. Uh, one was better known than the other. One was a Bill Johnson USA. And not knowing, you know, USA is a big country, what part or what state he was from, uh, that's all I knew about the gentleman. And then he was partnered with Bobby Verwey, which was a very good player at the time from uh, South Africa. He was like uh, under Gary Player's wing. And uh, so we come up the, uh, the last hole and uh, here comes Arnold Palmer off the first tee. And Bill, uh, he was a club professional at Phoenix Country Club, but at the same time played part-time on the tour. And so he knew Arnold because Arnold came and played in the tournament in Phoenix here. And they uh, went over and waved to everybody and back then, Ray, the Open was a 50, you had a 36 hole cut and a 54 hole cut. So there was two cuts in the Open. And of course, Bill had, as a club professional from America, had done very well. Well, you know, that's, that's great, but I, I know there's, there's a little bit more to this story. Well, you know, it's a, it's a small world and uh, golfers are golfers and, and we, uh, 37 years later, I'm here playing in the final of the match play championship in the Southwest PGA section, and uh, <clears throat> I'm playing Bill Johnson. And so uh, I uh, beat him like three and two in the final. So we go into cl the clubhouse to uh, presentation and trophy and all that and have a cold beer, what have you. And so we're sitting visiting and the open story came up in 1960. And he was telling me how he uh, enjoyed playing in the open and uh, talking with Arnold Palmer and what have you. I said, Bill, you won't believe this. I was your scoreboard carrier. Oh, he just kind of froze. And, and I explained my story. He said, yeah, you went over to um, shake hands with Arnold Palmer. He said, yeah, you are right. So he said, <laughs> so 37 years later, uh, we crossed paths. It's a you small know. world when it, you're a golfer, Dennis. It certainly is, miles apart. You know, Dennis, uh, coming to America must have been kind of quite a shock from, you know, coming from, from a small country like Scotland. Um, could you tell us a little bit about, you know, coming over here and what you yeah. expected and what you got and yeah. just everything else? 
Number one was the climate change, uh, Ray, the heat and the humidity that I wasn't used to being coming from a, a northern country. And so uh, I remember the first time that I went out and played golf and I had shorts on. My boss had given me a pair of shorts and, and uh, man, I came over there and I was just like a beetroot. I was just red, red, red. And going forward as I played, I thought it was never going to uh, tan, if you will. I was peeling and peeling and peeling because of my fair skin and all that. Oh. Today, a little bit different, but uh, back then getting started, it was a whole different. And then, you know, the, the, the scary thing was driving on the wrong side of the road. Oh, I mean the right <laughs> side of the road. And th so that was a, an education there too. So I, had not, I didn't have a driver's license uh, when I came to the States. I hadn't learned to drive because you have to be 18 years old before you can uh, drive in, in Scotland. So I was just uh, uh, a learner driver over in Scotland. So uh, it was a couple of three months and then I started taking driving lessons and getting used to that there. But uh, back to the golf course, you know, I came to work at a championship golf course and uh, I was anxious to get out and play it and see uh, a US uh, champion course. And my boss wouldn't let me, he told me, go down and practice because here I was, I was coming from the little ball that we talked about to the big ball. And he wanted me to get used to the, the flight path and, and the control of the big ball. So I practiced, it was two or three weeks before I first got uh, uh, first uh, opportunity to play. And the, the foursome that I was in was very nerve wracking. It was the retired golf professional, it was the golf professional and the club president. And I always remember after we played two holes, the uh, retired golf professional, he was an old Scotsman too, Wotherspoon was his name. And he told me, he says, Dennis, when you play with the members, piece of advice, he says, never play the first two holes well. And then you can press when you're on the third hole. <laughs> so, Great story. You know, all, all those years, you know, I, I still do that today. <laughs> um, you, you know, Dennis, talking about that, uh, when you came over here, uh, you had a high school diploma uh, mm -hmm. uh, from, from Scotland. What, what, right. What's the story on that? Of course, you know, becoming an apprenticeship, there's schooling involved uh, to join the PGA of America. And uh, first of all, I had to become a citizen, so I had to wait for five years uh, living in the, in the United States. And uh, so when I became eligible for that, I had all my uh, uh, PGA uh, paperwork, bookwork uh, together, and so I applied for membership. And I got turned down, and I couldn't believe it, but in the constitution of the PGA was that uh, you had to have a high school diploma within the boundaries of the United States. Well, I had a Scottish high school diploma, and that wasn't any good. So uh, I went back to, uh, I was rejected from uh, joining, and I went back and uh, got my GED that winter, and uh, so turned in the paperwork from there and uh, became a, a PGA member. Now that next year, a gentleman by the name of Mark Kazar was the president of the PGA, and he was in Oklahoma, and uh, so at their next national meeting, they changed that rule to just a high school diploma, not a U.S. high school diploma. Is that I knew the Dennis that, Allen rule? Well, they, they should have named it that, but they didn't, yeah. Dennis, you uh, started out here in this country at uh, Southern Hills in Tulsa, and I mean, that's a phenomenal golf course, and, and what a great place to start. Um, tell us a little bit about your, your, your first job. Well, it was really, really fortunate and a unique way that I was introduced to the gentleman who was the head golf professional and eventually brought me over. I mean, when I came over, we talked about driving on the wrong side of the road and what have you. And, you know, I, because I didn't have my own uh, vehicle, what have you, that I stayed with he and his family for the first couple of months. And then, but uh, getting back to the golf course, uh, we hosted the uh, U.S. Amateur Championship the first year I was there and Bob Murphy won that there, that was in 65. And then in 1970, we hosted the PGA Championship and Dave Stockton uh, and Arnold Palmer were the finalists and Stockton uh, survived uh, beating Arnie down the stretch there. And so it was such a, a learning experience for me as to being involved with how a major tournament is run behind the scenes as a staff member and uh, enhanced me as to going forward and becoming uh, a golf professional myself and director of golf and quality service because it was a millionaire's golf club and the service was to the utmost and uh, we were always, you know, I was schooled very well there. So it was a great start, a great foundation for me in 
in the direction that I wanted to go. Um, you know, one time you told me a great story about uh, working there, a big tournament uh, there at, at Southern Hills. Uh, tell us that one. That's a great story. You know, in 1970, um, it was, I think, either the first or second round, and Arnold Palmer was being paged to the first tee, and uh, we couldn't find him. And adjacent to the first tee was our uh, bag room and cart room. And he's down there, he's got a three iron, and he is hammering on it, changing the loft on it to become a two iron. And because he wanted it, because the, uh, the rough was so severe that it was played in August. And of course the heat and humidity in Oklahoma, if you've ever experienced that, it's tremendous. And I think Arnie was always tinkering with clubs and this just one situation prior to him playing this round. <laughs> wow, that, that's a great story. That was a good one. Did he make it? Yeah, he did, yeah. Dennis. Tell us a little bit about your uh, tournament history in this country. You've uh, done pretty well that, w that way. Maintain, uh, you know, I like to practice a lot and I'm a type of player. My own game is I, I feel the club head rain. So I've never really been coached per se because I know my own golf swing. I mean, when I'm in competition and playing and I hit a bad shot, I know uh, what caused it. And cause and effect during a round is very, uh, helpful because you can struggle and just you know shoot an 80. I hate shooting 80 sure. things like that and uh, so I became um, when I turned 50 in uh, 95 um, the next month was the Southwest section senior championship at San Marcos and I was the head pro at the uh, Awatuki Country Club in, Aw in uh, Awatuki and uh, I uh, I'd just come back off of a trip from Scotland, so I'd been playing a little bit. And uh, so it was a 36 hole tournament. And so long story short, I uh, won the uh, senior championship at my first go at it. So, you know, it, it, things became easier because I figured if I could win once, I could win again. And the uh, history of me winning that became, I won the match play championship in the Southwest section. And also I won the team championship up at Greyhawk with another guy. And uh, I won it twice with two different partners. Wow, that's uh, pretty fulfilling. So uh, that was, uh, you know, I became, I've got a level head. You need a level head to be competitive and all that. I'm not a guy that gets mad at my own game and all that. And, and golf is a, is, it's a patient game. Well, Dennis, uh, we're just about to wrap this up here. And we really appreciate the time that you've given us today. Uh, it's been very in insightful. Uh, the stories about Scotland, uh, the, the golfing here, uh, your, your job in Tulsa, I mean, you, you've had a, a, a great a great career, uh, your, your victories as a senior. So it's been very insightful and we really appreciate it. Now, we're also going to include all of your contact information, Dennis. So if people want to actually come and take lessons from you directly, they, they can contact you directly. And I believe that you also do corporate outings. Is that correct? Yes, I do. And we'll in, include that information too. So uh, we really appreciate it. And uh, we want everybody to stay tuned. Uh, Dennis is gonna give us some great lessons out on the course. Mm -hmm. uh, they're gonna be very insightful and I think they're gonna help a lot of golfers. So uh, thank you for uh, watching this and uh, have a good day. Thank you, Ray, it was a pleasure. You too.